Well, it's nice to see everybody. I recognize some old timers that I haven't seen in a while, and I'm sure many of you are pretty new. And uh, it's always the case with these introduction to mindfulness meditation classes. Some people have been practicing for 10, 20 years, and other people just heard about meditation and somehow decided maybe I should check it out. But one of the really astounding things as human beings, I mean, really, I think it's truly astounding, even though it might not initially seem that way to you, but maybe over the weeks it will. But here we are, we're human beings, presumably. We have this heart or mind, you know, in Buddhism, we don't really distinguish between those two words like we do in English. Chitta is the Pali word for, could be translated as heart or mind. But we have this knowing, feeling capacity as a human being. And as we lived our lives, you know, for a long time, many of us, just imagine how much actual time we've spent being interested directly, immediately interested in noticing, observing, paying attention to the heart, to the mind. Here it is, the mind is doing what the mind does, the heart is doing what the heart does. But the, when we reflect, honestly reflect how much curiosity we've had about our mind, about our heart, it's surprisingly limited. And yet clearly the fact that there is a mind, there is a heart and its nature is relevant. <laughs> it's so relevant to being a human being. And yet we've been so strangely incurious about it. That is truly amazing. And hopefully this class, these six weeks we'll have together on Tuesday night, it will be our chance together. And then when you're practicing at home, you know, when we're not meeting together in little spontaneous moments through the day. And then hopefully you'll put aside some time every day for what we might call more formal practice where you have shut your cell phone off. You've told the people you live with to leave you alone for a little bit. You've convinced your dog or cat to be in the other room. And you've got that relatively secluded space, secluded from your duties and responsibilities to more specifically and with fewer interruptions to notice, oh my God, there is a mind here. There is a heart here and observe it. So in a funny way where mindfulness practice or just more generally the Buddha's teachings on using awareness using the knowing mind to see what we haven't seen about our experience and about the nature of the mind, the nature of the heart itself. We're stabilizing present moment awareness so it can be used to observe the nature of the mind. And then we start to live, not from a place of ignorance, but from a place of knowing starting over time learning a thing or two about the nature of the mind, the nature of experience, the nature of the heart. How could we possibly expect to be a skillful human being, a wise and compassionate human being, if we don't have a clue about the nature of our own mind? And of course, essentially, the nature of my mind is not different than the nature of your mind. It really helps us navigate our human life, getting to know the mind. So let's just do a simple exercise at the beginning. And already, <clears throat> it doesn't matter if you're new to meditation, we have a lot of baggage, a lot of ideas of what meditation is. So even now when I say we're going to do a little exercise, you might notice, oh, oh yeah, if we're going to meditate, I got to sit this way, or I got to do this with my mind. So just be aware of all that kind of pre-programming you might have about what we're doing. So we're just here. You don't have to change your posture. And you can have your eyes open or closed. 
But just notice now what the mind is aware of. What is the mind knowing right now? And you might be like a deer in headlights and panic, and then you can know that that's what the mind is knowing. It's knowing the experience of self-consciousness or panic or whatever it is you're knowing. And whatever you're knowing now, whatever the mind, the heart is feeling, the mind is knowing, can you leave it alone? Can you just let it be? Can you know now, so now we're directing the attention, can you know the sensations relatively subtle at the top of the head. So if you have a lot of hair, you might feel some weight of the hair. If you don't have any hair at the top of your head, you might feel the temperature of the air that's making contact. You might feel some pressure under the skull, the quality of vibration, can you feel the ears just as they are? And you don't need to get tight. There's no tension required. It's more about opening to the ears. Maybe they're a little warm, maybe they're a little cool. Can you feel sensations at the brow, the forehead? Can you let them be, these sensations, the temples, feel the jaw, the muscles of the jaw, sense the wetness of the mouth. The jaw, the teeth, the lips, are the lips open or closed? dry or wet. And for a few more seconds, just feeling the entire head and face together. Let this be really simple. We're not trying to make any particular experience, but simply noticing that there are these sensations of the head and face here. And now we're noticing that they're being known. So in a sense, if we languaged it, we'd say, the mind is aware of the sensations throughout the head. And we can just gracefully move down the body, taking a few moments and simply opening, receiving the different sensations in the throat. And some may be unpleasant, some may be neutral, some might be pleasant, but we're not judging the sensations, we're just noticing the throat feels like this now. And then the sides of the neck, just as they are, on the back of the neck. And really the very heart of the Buddha's mindfulness practice is being both intimate and also free of grasping, free of any agenda. So we can try that out with the neck now, just intimate, clearly aware, but letting the different sensations that we're aware of, letting that be the way that it is. And how about down into the tops of the shoulders and shoulder joints, intimate and letting things be. And how about down both 
arm. So perhaps feel the blouse, the shirt, making contact with the skin of the biceps. Feel the underarms. Feel the sensations of the bend of the elbows. Feel the air maybe touching the back of the hands. Notice the different places of contact, hands where they're touching, arms where they're touching. So again, just this very beautiful, simple training of being intimate with the arms and hands. And at the same time, just allowing the sensations to be, to come and go, non-grasping, we call it or non-attachment. And initially it might seem paradoxical to be intimate, usually goes along with being, having an agenda, but how about being aware, being alert, being intimate, but without any agenda with the arms and hands. Instead, just letting things be. And opening now to the upper chest, upper back, collarbones, shoulder blades. Feel the structure of the rib cage, maybe gently expanding and contracting here in the chest and upper back. Feel the breastbone the lower ribs, solar plexus, kidneys. So the upper half of the torso. And you notice the thing about mindfulness, it's, it really has a generous quality, a generous awareness, really fully showing up in this case, to the upper torso, just as it is, no agenda. And let the awareness then sink further down into the lower half. So the belly and the lower back, including the structure of the pelvis, and the sits bones. And again, just that simple practice, learning how to be both intimate and allowing these sensations to be what they are. Even if there's some tension, we give that permission to be the way it is. So from the hip sockets there, begin to feel both thighs, Again, notice the obvious touch points. And then feeling the bend of the knees, whatever that's like. The shins, the calves. Feel down through both ankles. down to the heels. And the sides and tops of the feet. Bottoms of the feet. And the toes. And we'll take a few more moments as we Learn how to be intimate, learn how to be aware of the sensations in the legs and feet. And just allowing everything to be the way it is. Not needing the legs and feet to be different. 
and then the whole body together now. And this is an interesting thing about mindful awareness. The object can be very specific or the object can be very inclusive, like now the entirety of the whole body We're not favoring any sensation over another. Everything belongs intimate with the whole body and letting it be. And another very important thing to notice as we're mindful of the whole body Notice the particular effort you need to be aware, to be intimate with the whole body. It's not a tight kind of effort. It's more just the effort to remember there are these sensations now coming and going. This flow of sensation is the body. So the effort is just this more refined effort of keeping it in mind or not forgetting the body. It's not that much work to be aware of the body here in the present moment. Now here's an interesting question before we end just sitting here where the body is a way to stop being aware just check an off button We want to notice that this reflective awareness, this mirror-like awareness, what we call mindful awareness, is a natural capacity of the mind. We might imagine that I have to be mindful, but it's much more I'm recognizing that there is mindfulness, there is this reflective knowing, oh, it's like this now, sitting, the sensations of the sitting body are like this. So if your eyes have been closed, feel free to open them. If you'd like, stretch your body if you need to. So again, it's really nice to be with everybody. I know some of you, but a lot of you I probably don't know, haven't met. So I'll just give a brief introduction. My name's Mark Nunberg, and way back in 1993, my spouse, a partner, Win Fricky and I started Come Ground Meditation Center. Uh, we get Win to teach some of the times at Common Ground, but she's a full-time professor at McAllister College in the theater and dance department. So I'm the guiding teacher, and we now have an associate director, Shelley Graff, who does a lot of teaching at the center and a number of other teachers. And we're a Buddhist meditation center and the Theravada or early Buddhist tradition similar to the kind of Buddhism you'd find in Thailand and Sri Lanka and Burma, Cambodia and and Laos, a few other places in Asia. And it's the uh, kind of Buddhism that is a little bit more, a little bit less ornate and more sort of grounded in this person, this particular teacher that we refer to as the Buddha just the human being, of course. 
who uh, through studying with some of the teachers at the time and and really in some ways going his own way uh, came upon a pretty deep understanding of his own heart and mind and also had the talent to be able to articulate what he had come to understand so that over the generations people really benefited from these teachings and it's kind of like an art and science of the heart and mind that's what buddhism really is this especially this early buddhist tradition it's not really so metaphysical as it is psychological but calling it psychological sort of uh, makes it seem more like a therapeutic or a healing um, practice and it is but it's it's really much more than that because as we continue with the practice it really exposes and begins to uproot some of the deepest conditioning around fear and around alienations and, and it's just that whole ideology of separation being apart not feeling uh not really feeling the whole and it's really hard as you can see to put it into words but that's okay because you know people come to these classes for any number of reasons i got a stressful job and i want to handle it better <laughs> i have a couple kids and i want to you know i don't, I don't want to get angry at them and yet i get angry you know so there's any number of reasons we come but i i guess the reason i mentioned what i just said is you want to stay open you may come for a little stress reduction but keep your mind open to what the practice really has to offer and i always say this at the beginning too you know some things you maybe can learn in six weeks but what we're after you know it's really a lifestyle that's against the stream of our culture we're like to the degree this makes sense you feel like oh yeah this makes a lot of sense it's a valuable thing for me to begin to integrate into my life but then you're talking about a lifetime of practice and the six-week course is really designed to give us enough of a taste to have some sense of whether this this is important i need to make time i need to make space for this so that i can begin to cultivate this lifestyle of awareness instead of getting swept along by our more cultural vibe of distractedness and superficiality and reactivity because isn't that really the way it is and and in some ways our economy it thrives because of our because of these deep values of distraction you know and entertainment and uh, addiction to intensity of one kind or another even spicy food and spicy movies and spicy conversations and spicy news items have you ever observed mindfully observed yourself reading the news you know especially on the internet where there are a lot of options and what news items your attention goes to and what news items your mind ignores and you see what you'll get to see what i'm saying so what the buddha came to understand you know just to keep it really simple the first night is that <laughs> we human beings we have a lot of stress we get pushed around by our likes and dislikes just surviving is not so easy navigating issues of power and navigating issues of difference having an intimate intimate relationship with another human being let alone raising kids these are really challenging things and uh, to help us survive just being a human being we've learned and it turns out to not be uh, it, it works in the short term but it doesn't work in the long term we've learned to rely on a lot of fixed ideas fixed views fixed opinions like even something we wouldn't think is true but like even with our partners those of you who are in an intimate relationship or have a good friend or a, a sibling that you're you know you have a long-time relationship a lot of 
that relationship is more about our fixed view. You know, when we're interacting with that person, to a large degree, we're interacting with our idea of that person. We're not really relaxed, we're not really present in an open way when we're interacting with people. And you can maybe even sense it now, you know, you might see one of those two inch boxes on your Zoom screen right now, you know, and you might just get some superficial characteristics of somebody, the color of their skin, sense of their age, kind of clothes, kind of home. And very quickly we have an idea and we're not really showing up. You might have that about me, you probably do. This is how our mind works. And we don't, we're not gonna lose and we don't need to lose this capacity of creating an idea. It's more about how fixed the mind is with the ideas that we do construct. And we're constructing them all the time. And that doesn't have to be a problem. So what the Buddha discovered is that the real, at the root of our stress, like life being burdensome, it's hard to raise kids, it's hard to have a partner, it's hard to earn a living, it's hard to engage the world to make it more just and to respond to the uh, groups of people that are not being treated well, you know, like the injustice in the world. It's really complex and it's really hard. And when we really look, the root of these problems is this habit of fixing on ideas. And the root of that tendency to fix has to do with a particular idea that in Buddhism we call selfing, you know, self-centeredness. But we can't think our way out of the habit of being self-centered. We actually have to get intimate with it. And that's the basic path the Buddha realized is to resolve problems, we have to get intimate. We have to be a radical learner, which means we have to open in this place of humility to the way it is. And then we know how to respond. And we often, you know, when there is a problem in our life, we often maybe do some analysis, but we very quickly have an idea. Usually the idea is something like, it's your fault, <laughs> right? But some of us, you know, are more negative towards ourselves and blame ourselves. But in any case, we're kind of in this fixed stance. And so now we know what to do. We need to get rid of the enemy. And there's no nuance. And we keep missing the basic problem. So the Buddha's basic approach is the, uh, the problem, the cause for suffering is not seeing clearly, not really feeling or understanding deeply the way it is. So to resolve that, we can't think our way to deeper understanding. We actually have to develop the heart that can see clearly. So that's why in Buddhist practice, there's such an emphasis on what gets badly translated as concentration. Concentration is not a very good word, uh, English word for the Pali word samadhi, because when we hear concentration, we always, almost always think about focusing attention, like a one-pointed focus. And that's not a very good translation of what the Buddha means by samadhi. Samadhi is that stable, settled, clear, balanced mind or heart. And that balance, that stability, can actually see what we're not seeing. And in Buddhism, we call that insight, vipassana. So Common Ground Meditation Center, where I teach, um, is a vipassana or insight meditation center. And generally the Theravada or early Buddhist tradition, as it's come to the West, we don't often use that word Theravada, which just means the teachings of the elder, the elders. Um, we generally use, oh yeah, it's a Vipassana center or insight meditation center. That's the word you hear often. And the reason we emphasize that word Vipassana or insight is 
that's the whole reason we meditate. We're training the attention, training awareness to be stable, in a way, unflappable unflappably aware of the way it is in the present moment. And it just sets up the deepening of understanding. Because otherwise what people do is they read about what others have said, deep understanding is, and then they imitate it. But that's not deep understanding. It's a little stinky to kind of, you know, talk about emptiness or nothing, you know, there's no self or these really interesting philosophical ideas, but they're not based on our own experience. So the real emphasis in practice isn't so much to understand intellectually the underlying nature of experience or the underlying nature of the mind, but to develop those particular muscles, mental muscles, to have stability of present moment awareness throughout the day. So when we're doing our formal sit, let's say you're fortunate, you can put aside 45 minutes every day during these six weeks to practice, or maybe twice a day, 20 minutes each, right? Or maybe you only have five minutes. You've got three kids, you've got a busy job, and you can just do five to 10 minutes a day. So that formal time, it's really just, you're optimizing the conditions, reducing things that are distracting, so that it's a little bit easier to find that stability, that continuity of present moment awareness. But actually, we want to practice all day long. But you know, when we're in the middle of our day, at work or wherever, the mind is going to get lost in thought, it's going to get absorbed in some activity, and for long periods of time, we're not going to be aware that this is being known. That's what we mean by mindfulness. Mindfulness is this stability of awareness that recognizes, oh, this is being known. Like right now, we all have a body and we can have a body and never be aware that we have a body. But right now, because I'm prompting us all, we can be aware, oh yeah, sitting, is being known. The sensations of sitting, they're being known now. Right? So then there's a moment of awareness. Now, as the evening goes along, you know, we've got another hour, a little less, can we sustain, at least in moments, how many moments between now and nine o'clock can we have a simple reflective knowing, oh yeah, sitting is like this or hearing Mark's voice is like this, or seeing the screen. Not looking at this person, or because that kind of is like we get absorbed in my ideas of who I'm seeing and who they are, but that more soft gaze. Oh yeah, it's just, this is seeing being known. Hearing is being known. That's the stability of awareness. And the more of that stability of present moment awareness, what we call mindful awareness, the more of that we have, the deepening of insight happens naturally. You can't actually stop the deepening of understanding, the deepening of wisdom, the more you have the continuity of present moment awareness. And the, the important thing to remember is we can't go directly to becoming a wiser person. Wisdom, real wisdom, real human wisdom in terms of understanding our heart and the heart, understanding the nature of experience, and in particular, understanding how suffering, how stress arises, and how it ceases. It arises naturally from only one source, the continuity of present moment awareness. Anybody you've bumped into in your life that seemed to have a lot of natural, grounded wisdom, that wisdom that you sensed in that person could only come from this way. Try getting wise any other way. I don't think it works. And that was certainly the Buddha's take on it, on the issue too. In fact, there's a story I just we mentioned in a, I was doing the Common Grounds Buddhist Studies program last night. And uh, there's a famous story right the night before the Buddha died. 
it was a, a wanderer seeking teachings, you know, and the Buddha was under a tree kind of out, you know, in the woods near a town. And he was supported there with some of his longtime students. And, you know, he's on his deathbed, so he is obviously very weak. He's 80 years old on top of being really sick. And this wanderer shows up, the seeker shows up looking for the Buddha because he has some questions. And they try to send him away, but he was persistent. And then the Buddha overheard and said, okay, send, I'll, I'll talk to him. I'll give him some teachings. And it's just a really sweet little story, you know, there on the deathbed. And the person was just wondering, you know, he, he, the question was sort of this, you know, a lot of, I met a lot of powerful teachers in my day and they all tell me they know the answer. And so now he's asking the Buddha, how do I know who I should listen to? And so the Buddha sort of rejected. He said, listen, don't worry about that question. I'll tell you what you need to know. And basically he said, you know, in so many words, that anybody who's cultivating the continuity of present moment of awareness, the stability of present moment awareness, and their, their teachings are really based on this turning the awareness toward the heart and mind itself, they're going to develop liberating wisdom. And anybody who's not doing that isn't going to develop liberating wisdom. And it doesn't matter how they talk about it. It just matters whether you do the work. If you live a life of distraction, not being aware of what's happening here, we can repeat, do, do the same thing we've done before, get the same results. We've, we can be trapped in repeated cycles forever. Isn't that true? We know people who keep doing the same thing, getting the same results because they haven't found the supports or the instructions or the incentives to become mindfully aware. Now just imagine we had some really, you know, unwholesome habit. I mean, could we continue to be a jerk if we had this very clear present moment awareness, seeing it in living color as we were being judgmental, as we were being hurtful, or as we were repeating some harmful addictive behavior. If we saw it and felt it as it actually was moment by moment, it's really hard to continue acting in unwholesome ways when we're really clear. But we're, when we're oblivious, we can continue unwholesome patterns forever because we're oblivious. And this is the basic premise of the practice is realizing that there's stress in my life and that I cause other people to be tight and stressful and plant seeds of suffering all around. And sensing, as the Buddha instructs us, that the root of that unskillfulness is something going on in my heart and mind that I'm not seeing clearly. And he gives us a more clear pointing out instruction, right? That it's, it's related to self-centeredness and the greed and the hate and the fear and the, de the sort of delusion that flows from self-centered habits, right? And the resolution of those causes for stress is to stabilize present moment awareness because when you see the conditional nature of suffering, like how my mind is involved in me becoming tight, then it's much easier to uh, unhook from those patterns. But the not seeing of it means it's just going to keep repeating itself over and over. So the, the last thing I want to say before we do some more practice would we'll do a little stretch and then and do a little bit more practice. Just to keep it easy for the first week or two. Um, so you can give yourself instructions, you know, when you get lost in thought and then you remember, oh yeah, I'm sitting. What am I supposed to do? And then you, this is what you can remind yourself. Okay, two qualities. And we're bringing these two qualities together so they can work together. I'm, real, I'm learning to really value alertness that clarity, that bright clarity. Or you could use the word interest, but not 
interested in sort of an intellectual understanding, but interested in being close and really touching or one teacher called it rubbing up against the present moment, rubbing up against the way it is, really meeting, connecting with the moment. So that's one we're really interested in developing that interest, that alertness, that brightness. And we're really interested in the quality of release and relaxation and trust. And it seems initially, it might seem to you that well, I can be relaxed, but then my mind's dull. Or I can be really alert, but then my mind and body's a little tight. But this, the, your homework for the first couple of weeks is to see how those two qualities actually work quite well together. That the relaxation really supports the clarity and seeing clearly. And the seeing clearly and the clarity and the alertness really supports supports relaxation, right? Because it sees how the body and mind is holding in ways that it doesn't need to hold. Oh, I can relax. I can open. I can soften. And I, I kind of uh, mentioned that in the guided meditation we did earlier when I was talking about effort, like when we were feeling the whole body and I prompted you all, like how much effort is needed to remain aware of the whole body. So that's that soft relaxation. It's like keeping the body in mind, being interested in the sensations of the body doesn't require tension. It requires remembering. It requires interest. It requires alertness. That alertness is not the same as tightness in the same way that relaxation is not the same as dullness. But we often associate relaxation with dullness, just like we often associate clarity with tension. That's why concentration isn't a good translation for the word samadhi, because for most of us, when we hear that word concentration, we think we got to, you know, we even scrunch our face, like, I'm concentrated. <laughs> but that's not concentration, that's being tight. You know, and when we're tight, we don't see clearly. You can't really be alert when you're tight. You can pay kind of attention when you're tight, but the tightness actually gets in the way of being intimate and seeing things as they actually are. So again, that's all you really need to remember. I'll, I'll go through a more formal instruction of mindfulness of breathing in just a moment. But in terms of reorienting yourself when you get distracted or lost in thought, just bring those two qualities to mind. Okay, Mark mentioned relaxation and alertness. I've got the present moment, whatever I'm feeling in my body, whatever I'm hearing, whatever mental activity there might be, emotional activity, can I be alert and relaxed? Alertness does not mean controlling the experience. It just means being interested. Relaxation doesn't mean ignoring. It just means being soft, not tight. And so whatever's predominant, just meet it with alert and relaxed presence. That's how we relate to distractions. Alert, clear, oh yeah, this is being known and relaxed. Can this be okay? Yeah, sometimes it's like this. Alert and relaxed. And then come back to what we call the anchor. So uh, I'll talk about the anchor during the guided meditation, but maybe just take a moment and feel free to stand, and, uh, but not more than a minute or two, and uh, stretch a little bit, and then we'll sit it in a comfortable way when you're ready.
So start thinking about sitting back down. And we'll sit for about 20, 25 minutes now. And I'll give some basic mindfulness of breathing just so you have a reference. What we did at the beginning, moving the awareness through the body, that general style of practice we call body scan meditation. And there are many different ways of doing it. But that you've already learned one technique that you can use. That's a really useful technique to kind of have under your belt, something you can do, especially when your mind um, feels a little distracted and you've had a busy day. Doing a very methodical but kind, soft, relaxed body scan like we did at the beginning. A really great technique to use. But now we're going to do a slightly different technique. And it's one the, the Buddha really emphasized. And in a way, the Buddha taught many different styles of meditation because there are many ways to work with the mind. But mindfulness of breathing um, was one of the ones he kept coming back to. And one he did himself, even well after his deep awakening, he continued to do mindfulness of breathing practice. So just sitting comfortably. It does help to hold the body still, but not in a way that requires tightness. So if you need to move at some point, just make those gentle movements with awareness. But to the degree you can, after you've made your last adjustments, just settle into a relative stillness. And I'll talk more about posture next week, but if you can, appreciating the alignment of the spine without being tight and inviting whatever muscles can soften and relax to do that. And it can be a nice ritual at the beginning of a sit to breathe in, filling the lungs, exhale slowly, emptying the lungs, and to do that maybe three to five times. But really slow it down and do it in a relaxed way where you're filling and then emptying the lungs in a very long and easy way. So maybe one more time. Gentle, long inhalation, followed by a gentle and long exhalation. And eventually allowing the breathing to continue on its own. It's so nice that the body knows how to breathe, that we don't need to mentally manage the breathing process. But don't worry if it feels controlled, because it might, but don't intentionally feel like you have to manage or control the breath. And beginning by feeling the whole body sitting, sitting sensations are being known. And just notice those two qualities I mentioned here as we're aware of the body sitting. Notice that clarity, that alertness or interest and how it works well with being relaxed and just allowing things to be. Sitting aware of the whole body, which means that we'll feel the movement of the breath right there in the experience of the whole body sitting. So just tune in to that particular movement of the breath coming in, movement as the breath goes out. Wherever that movement of the breathing process is clear, for some people it's the touching at the nostrils. 
other people it's the rising and falling of the belly, the abdominal wall, or some combination. Just be aware of the sensations of breathing in and aware of the sensations of breathing out. And using this very beautiful interest, see if you can connect with the beginning of an in-breath. And then in a simple way, sustain awareness through the in-breath all the way to the very end. And then at the very beginning of the out-breath, sustaining that simple presence all the way through to the end. And can we be aware of this movement of breathing in and breathing out without needing to get tight or controlling? And if you need to, just remind yourself to relax. Honey, it's okay to relax. It's okay to soften. And just allow the breathing to happen. Even if it feels controlled or rough, Trust that the body knows how to breathe. And one of the lessons we're learning now at the beginning, by being interested in this normal process of breathing in and breathing out, we're learning to let go of all the other obsessions and worries and hopes and planning and whatever else the thinking mind might be drawn into. We're practicing putting it all down by cultivating this simple interest, this relaxed interest in the sensations of breathing in and the sensations of breathing out. So let's try that for a while in silence.
So remember, don't presume that being distracted is a problem. When you notice that your mind is caught up in some thinking or irritated by some pain in the body or whatever it might be, then that's the time to remember those two qualities. You could even ask, can the heart be relaxed and alert with the way that it is right now? What would that feel like, look like to be relaxed and alert? And you can even use a, f a phrase in your mind. <coughs> you could say, oh, it's like this now. This is being known. And now those words are really coming from this relaxed and clear contact with the way it is right now. Oh, it's like this. This experience of the mind, the planning mind is being known where the worrying mind is being known. It feels like this. So it's important to acknowledge the distractions in a relaxed and alert way, clear way. And then you can come back, feel the whole body, feel the breath moving in the body. And you can work with your meditation anchor, the sensations of the breath, or some people prefer to work more generally with the sensations of the entire body sitting. Either way, it's okay. Specifically feeling the sensations of breathing in and breathing out, or more generally feeling the whole embodiment, the body sitting. Really explore from time to time those two qualities, like asking, can the heart and body be more relaxed, more soft? And another time asking the question, can the heart be more alert, can the mind be more clear, more present, more interested? So that we get a real sense of how those two qualities work together.
Some people even use the rhythm of the breath itself to remind themselves. So each time you breathe in, you can feel the breath coming in and let it be a reminder to be alert. And you can even repeat that word almost like a mantra. You could repeat the word alert or interested or bright, clear, clearly aware, breathing in seeing things as they are, clearly aware, breathing out, relax, allow, let things be. So in this kind of way, from time to time, when it's helpful, you can give yourself reminders. Use the in-breath to remember to be clearly aware, and using the out-breath to remember to relax and to allow, to soften. And be willing to begin again and again. Remember, initially, a lot of what we're learning is that it's safe to put down the world of our worries or plans or to-do lists. It's not forever. There's so much value in using the meditation anchor to drop temporarily everything else.
And we'll be sitting for another two minutes or so. And why not for these last two minutes, allow the eyes to open if they've been closed. And of course, we're not looking around, we're just gazing down, maybe toward the floor in front of us. Body is relaxed as best it can be. Sitting still for just a few more moments. And now let's let go of the meditation anchor of feeling the breath or feeling the body specifically. And instead, just notice whatever it is that's predominant, whatever it is that the mind is knowing, including if there's any self-consciousness, then in a relaxed and clear way, just acknowledging, oh yeah, this is being known, being felt. Because we need to get familiar with the thinking mind. Part of what the mind does is it thinks And it's possible to be mindfully aware that there is thinking. So we're not so thrown about or confused by the thinking. Instead, wisdom can learn how just to recognize, oh yeah, that's what the mind does, it thinks. And often there's an emotional charge, sometimes subtle, sometimes not subtle at all, related to the thinking. Oh yeah, that feels like this, the charge is like this. So again, just we're just sitting for another few seconds and we're noticing that there is this activity of the body, the five senses, right? The flow of sensations that can be known the flow of sound being heard, the flow of visual experience being seen. And there's this whole other category of experience we call mental activity, the flow of thoughts and emotions being known. And it's this activity of the body and mind that we call ourselves, my life. Or in Buddhist terms, we say, the experience is something being known. That's what it means to be alive. Something is being known or being felt one moment after the next. So again, take a moment, stretch, move your body, and notice how we can even continue the mindful awareness even as we're adjusting, doesn't have to end. One of the things over the many years of teaching this class, it's so valuable for people to hear other people reporting back about their experience in meditation, questions that are emerging. So we're going to always save some time, especially as the weeks go by, to hear from each other. So I encourage you during the week, like I mentioned before, set aside some time every day to sit, whatever you can do, even two sits a day. Give yourself that formal time where you've reduced distractions, you found a quiet place in your apartment, your home, cell phone off, pets in the other room, or at least they're not bothering you. So you can just turn your awareness inward to the knowing mind. What's the mind knowing? One moment after another. And you'll find not only is this the most valuable thing, it's also the hardest thing you're ever going to do. So I'm not trying to paint a pretty picture. It's not easy 
to cultivate mindful awareness. It's just really valuable to do it, even though it's hard. Because our, you know, part of it is just our animal conditioning to have our awareness go out into the world to see where our enemies are and our friends are, right? So to be aware in this reflective way what the mind is knowing, it seems a little strange initially until we get to understand it. So give yourself some time to explore. And let's take a few minutes now just to see if any comments or questions have emerged. Thanks for sharing and getting the conversation going. And one of the things you said that's really important, and I often say it in one of the first weeks of the course, that it's really nice to have a pleasant sit where there's a lot of calmness and peace, but that doesn't mean you learned a lot. And as Shannon mentioned, some of the times when the sit was from hell, it was really hard to get to the end of the sit, but you ended up learning a lot. So you can't equate the pleasantness of a meditation period, as nice as it is to have a pleasant meditation, with learning. And ultimately, the learning is more valuable than having a pleasant set. Now, we need some pleasant sets, otherwise we're not going to do it. If it's always hard, it's really hard to stick with it. But if it's hard periodically, that's kind of normal. Um, and when we have difficult circumstances because we're feeling sick or the four big dogs and the parents are loud or whatever it might be, you know, if there's something you can do, of course, do it. But if you don't have any other options, then turn the difficulty into practice. And just remember those two qualities. What would it be to be alert, intimate, and relaxed with the conditions as it actually is for me? right? To be aware of the loud sounds in a relaxed and alert way. That will take us a long way along this path. Thanks for getting us started, Shannon. Who would like to go next? What thoughts or questions come to mind? That you're bringing that up. I'll say a few words. And then for those who people maybe have learned a thing or two about working with pain. But the point, one of the points you made, Nikki, is that it's true when we bring this balance. So let's just presume the awareness has some stability. So there is that balance of alertness and relaxation with our present moment awareness. And there's some pain. Could be physical, could even be emotional, right? It can be any kind of pain. And then we bring that balanced attention to that experience because it's predominant. And in a sense, it's asking for attention. So awareness notices it. Well, because of that balance, it's going to amplify the experience because we're really showing up for it. So it's going to appear bigger. And one of the ways, you know, how it is that we manage the pain in our life is we stay busy and distracted. Like, you know, the classic is after a breakup and there's a lot of emotional pain, you know, people obsessively watch movies or do this or do that because they just don't want to feel what they're feeling. So they try to stay distracted or busy. Well, with this practice, we are developing the capacity to know, to expect that amplification when we take a close look, when we relax with it. Because like when we soften and relax, it's like we're putting down defenses. We're not armoring ourselves against the pain. We're saying, honey, you're here. Let me feel you. But we have to learn too that it's okay to turn away. Because you might be able to be skillful with the chronic pain for five minutes or 30 seconds. But at some point, the mind might lose its capacity to be stable and it starts getting defensive and tight. Well, then we don't want to keep looking at it because we're reinforcing a defensive stance with experience. So then it would be better to, to ask, well, what can I be aware of here in the present moment where I can be relaxed and alert? Well, maybe I'll open to hearing because hearing isn't charged. 
as opposed to the pain in my body. So you go to something else, or maybe I'll even open my eyes and just see the space of the room. So we can let uh, the mind open to other present moment phenomena, even if it's not predominant in the sense of asking for attention, but I'm choosing to be aware of this as opposed to struggling with the pain in my body. And you might end up doing more of a touch and go, where you open fully to the pain there in your body and you practice being alert and relaxed and you learn a few things and then you turn your attention away for a while. And you might come to the breath, you know, where you're just feeling the touching at the nostrils. Because for most people, if you're really attuned to that, everything else goes far into the background and it won't be so oppressive. Yeah, thanks. Anybody else want to share a little bit about what you've learned? Uh, work being mindful of physical pain or emotional pain? We have time for maybe one more question or comment, anything that feels relevant. Well, and we'll talk more about that next week, but it's really, it's a good place to end tonight because uh, they need to stay in balance. And, and depending on our particular temperament, we might be particularly good at one or life circumstances might make one really stronger than the other. And so that's why we need to get the sense of how they work together in balance. So what does it look like when our mind is dull and there's, you know, it's, the tranquility is relatively accessible, but it tends to slide us towards sleepiness. How can I make, how can I support interest and alertness without disturbing the relaxation and tranquility? That's the question. And you can even like, part of it is, I mean, you have to learn a couple techniques one of them is actually getting curious about the experience of being sleepy, like curious about the heaviness in the eyes, the heaviness in the body that comes with sleepiness, right? The fuzziness in the mind. There's a whole set of phenomena that arise as we're getting closer to sleepiness and, and sleep that can be observed. And wisdom can actually be like fascinated by the, how that whole process of getting sleepy is. All the way to the point of falling asleep, the alertness can be there. But, but we're not in the habit of being interested in falling asleep, right? So, th but you might, the other uh, technique to begin to experiment with, for those of you who have sleepiness, is to ask the knowing mind to do a little bit more work. And here's just a simple example. I've given you already uh, some cues about mentally noting what's happening. That takes work. Like to say to yourself silently in your mind, oh, this is being known. Planning mind is being known. Judging mind is being known. Achiness in the knee is being known. That's some work. And work energizes the mind. It supports that interest and that alertness. It's not a judgmental naming. You're just asking the knowing mind to recognize and name. And if you can't come up with a simple name, just call it this. This is being known. It's a little bit like putting a frame around the object that's being known one moment after another. And that little bit of work of mentally noting can help when there's a lot of sleepiness. That's a, a, an ancient uh, principle that people have learned over the centuries. If you're sleepy, if you want more energy, make effort. Making effort energizes the mind. And it's exactly the opposite. It's like when we're feeling sleepy, we think, oh, I can't make any effort. But if we actually start to make effort, we'll get a little energy. Now, last thing, of course, if you're not getting enough sleep, you got to get more sleep because what mindfulness will reveal is, honey, I'm really sleepy. <laughs> I need to go to bed. Well, go to bed. 
get caught up because it's hard to do anything in life when we're sleep deprived. Well, it's nine o'clock and I'm really good about starting on time and ending on time. Last thing I want to say is come next Tuesday, even if you really feel this is a good thing for you to be digging into, you might think of three or four other things you want to do on Tuesday night. So just be aware of that resistance or that not wanting to tune into Zoom. Maybe you've been on the computer all day. You don't want to do another hour and a half and come anyway. Because you can just be aware of that resistance. Oh, resistance feels like this. Not wanting to turn the computer on is like this. And do it anyway. Really give yourself six weeks to check it out. See how it might make sense in your life. And it's been nice to get to know you. Remember, jot down any questions that come up. It will be time next week. And we probably will have even um, a small group. I can divide you into small groups so you, everybody can share a little bit about what you're learning. We'll do that for maybe 10 minutes um, at some point uh, next week. And wishing you a good week of practice, everyone. Hope to see you next Tuesday night. Take care of yourselves.